All right, so I think that's working. Hopefully you, uh, you guys can all see that. I apologize for the uh, technical delay there. Uh, but today we'll talk about uh, perimeter pest control and uh, we'll get through this pretty quick. So uh, I'll get you guys all out on time. So again, going to look at, um, you know, do a little bit on safety, uh, key perimeter pests, you know, uh, treatments, and then some common pests. So safety share is about uh, transporting ladders. I know some of us do this in our daily work. Um, but, you know, make sure you do secure them down properly. Don't do like this gentleman here um, or uh, like these uh, these folks here. Uh, you know, anything falling off your vehicle, whether it's a ladder or other supplies or materials can be very, very dangerous and hazardous. And we just want to be safe in what we do every day. So I love pictures because they kind of give you a good um, idea uh, that something will stick in your head. You know, secure that ladder with two straps or that piece of equipment, whatever it is. So. Uh, be mindful of that and be safe. So uh, we're going to talk about, you know, perimeter pests. And, you know, why is, you know, the exterior so important? Because this is really where, you know, all of uh, most pests come from. So most pests are coming in from outside your home. You know, you can say some exceptions, maybe bed bugs or something like a German cockroach, but still they come from outside, whether you bring them in yourself or they come through a little crack or, or crevice, something like that. So exterior is really the key. So, you know, what, how do they get in, right? So cracks, openings, you know, uh, any kind of penetration through that outside wall, whether it's pipe or wire penetrations, you know, faulty window screens, faulty flashing around doors. Um, and again, they can also come in on us. So really, you know, looking at you know, how they get in, you know, and, and how, to, how to gain really good control doing perimeter pest is, you know, you wanna do an inspection. So you look for those conditions that you know favor uh, pest activity. Um, so access points, uh, look for areas that need modification. So whether that's, you know, again, fixing some of those, uh, you know, weather stripping, uh, things like that, you know, uh, around the structure. Uh, are there, you know, any kind of, you know, other openings that can be can be modified? Are there plants or harbages that need to be modified? Uh, and are there food and water sources there as well? So some inspection equipment, you know, this is kind of an old list. I, I like this list because it came from probably 10 or 15 years ago from a presentation I had. Um, I would say most of these things on here are probably contained within one device now. So you have a camera, you can sometimes zoom in with that camera. You have a flashlight on that camera or on that phone. You can, you can measure with that, you know, tablet or phone. Uh, you can take notes on that tablet or phone. So a lot of these things are all combined into one piece of equipment now that pretty much we all have. Um, and they're all kind of important because they can do some different things for you. But I do love uh, taking pictures and, um, you know, um, uh, getting a good, good bird's eye view of the actual site itself. So something I, I throw into a lot of my perimeter pest presentations, you know, comes from the old termite world of doing things. You know, we used to go out to a home, you know, we would draw a nice diagram of that home, mark off everywhere that we saw termites, areas for treatment, things like that. So why not do that same uh, exercise with, with perimeter pest or, or pest control in general? It gives a good view of the structure uh, and where things are that may need modification or where you find pests. It makes it very easy to explain to that homeowner or that potential customer where you found certain things. It also maybe gives you a step up on, uh, on other folks out there in the business uh, where, you know, if you come up to the customer with a nice diagram like this, explain what you're gonna do, show them where the problems are or issues are, um, maybe a little bit more professional uh, than, than some other folks. So again, important for the overall picture of the property. It may also help you figure out you know, how to cost the job. Uh, you get a nice uh, idea of, of the linear feet that you're treating. Um, shows those areas of activity or concern. Uh, great for homeowner communication. Um, also could help your, your office folks communicate with this customer if they call in and say, hey, you know, the technician was out here um, or the inspector was out here. Uh, you know, he said something about maybe there was an issue in the backyard. Where was that? You know, and if you note it on a graph like this or a diagram like this, it can help your office folks communicate so they don't then have to maybe call the inspector or call the technician, they can kind of handle that, you know, themselves, you know, right off the bat. So um, again, makes it a little bit easier for that communication. 
maybe even fewer callbacks. Now you don't have to maybe go out there and show them what you did or um, you know, explain things further, uh, which you know overall can potentially increase your your revenues or or profits, right? So so I like this idea. You know, it's not for everybody. Everyone, you know, I don't expect everybody to go out and just start graphing all their pest control, um, you know, accounts, but it can be something that can be helpful for you. Um, you could also maybe use something like a Google Earth program to get a good snapshot of that structure of that property, um, and then you can add things on from there. So, you know, where to pests get in, uh, all of these types of areas are, are definitely uh, areas where pests can come through, get into the home. Uh, this is, you know, there's a bunch of different electrical openings, you know, wire openings, whether it's telephone, cable, um, you know, uh, you have a hose bib here with a hose attached. So that's got moisture as well, but it does go through this wall um, and, and can provide a, a way for pests to get in. Uh, you also have, um, a uh, little conduit here for air conditioning uh, lines. Uh, they can get up behind that and make their way up into the structure as well. So a lot of different areas here to look at. The garage door over here, look for the weather stripping around it. Um, other areas to look at, you know, around the perimeter when you're doing your inspection. Um, window shutters, uh, they, you know, do harbor uh, a bunch of pests. Uh, this, I'm actually down in Florida, uh, and I find behind these shutters, you know, just about everything from bees and wasps to uh, large uh, frogs that love to get behind there and hang out there during the day. Um, you know, ants get through there, um, you know, other, other pests as well. Uh, also, you know, don't forget to look up. I think a lot of times we do our inspections and we kind of um, spend a lot of time looking down at the foundation level, but look up as well because you have things like these, uh, maybe some faulty flashing up there, uh, maybe a vent um, at the end of the, the uh, roof line there uh, that maybe is screened or not screened. So it could be allowing pests in, you know, depending, you know, it could also have a screen with, with holes in it or that's damaged. <clears throat> you know, in these corners or joint areas, uh, there could be uh, openings there where you don't have very tight fitting siding. You have soffit vents down here. Uh, if these are loose, again, uh, areas that pests can uh, make their way in. Um, the up around chimney areas, again, same things here. You know, you look for, you know, um, you know maybe faulty flashing, uh, openings, you know, around the, uh, the vent pipe. Uh, is it capped or not? You know, because you can get other types of critters in there. Um, you know, and again, you could also look for maybe there's a, a place there where you notice the shingles are damaged and could be a potential leak getting in that they don't, the homeowner doesn't know about. So again, it just shows that extra level of concern. Um, looking up at gutters, um, you know, these are areas that, you know, are also very important. You know, gutters can, you know, be clogged. They can contain a lot of debris. Uh, they could also hold a lot of water if they're clogged up. There's enough moisture there for you know ants to move in for sure. Uh, I've also found uh, paper wasp nests in this litter in the gutter. Uh, they'll kind of hollow out an area there and then build a nest. Um, you could get rodents and other things in there as well. So making sure these are clean. Uh, this is also a very key area uh, for things like springtails. Uh, they love to be up in this type of damp, moist uh, uh, areas. And, uh, you know, again, somewhere to, you know, don't forget to look up, you know, at that gutter. Um, so just to kind of further that point, you know, this is a home that, uh, unfortunately, a, a, a pest control operator had done a treatment here and the homeowner said, hey, you know, you did your treatment and you caused all this discoloration on my house. And he went out, took some pictures, you know, sent them to me. We took a look at it and I think it's very clear what the issue is here. Um, you can see there's actually plants growing out of the gutters. So they're not only clogged and full, uh, you could also see here where the, it overflows and brings all this nasty debris that's here, washes it down over the side of the house. You've got moisture issues here, here, just all around the structure. So um, I call this uh, gutter gardening and that's a, uh, a real good sign that there's some moisture issues going on. Uh, they haven't cleaned those for, for a very long time. So these are all things that can help you in your, your uh, uh, control and your communication with, with that customer.
Um, again, look for wires coming through. Um, down here in Florida, we have a lot of these patio drains. So you have an ice cream porch or patio, uh, but then you have an opening right here where things can get in and they crawl up through these slots, uh, you know, in that, um, in that drain, make their way into the patio area and uh, can cause some issues uh, down the road. So, yeah. um, also, when you're you're looking for you know looking around the structure, you know don't be blinded by maybe an obvious you know damaged screen. You know, look under it. You look under those window sills. You know, for you know maybe faulty caulking. You know things like that, because uh, again, it's it's something that you know the more areas of concern you can find, the more areas that are conducive to pests, you know, the better off uh, your treatment's going to be. Um, this was an interesting one. Um, this is a stucco uh, siding uh, on a house. Uh, it looks like there was a, um, a repair done to it, uh, but you can also see, you know, these straight lines here where those repairs were done. And lots of ants, you know, trailing up here, you know, getting into that, connection between the, the repair and the actual uh, older siding that was there, or older stucco that was there. So really this repair was not sealed up properly, probably moisture getting in there um, and definitely enough area for, for ants to make their way in. So again, great entry point here and something that not only just for pest control, but really for um, potential damage to the house needs to be sealed up properly uh, and not allow moisture and, uh, and pests you know, into those areas. Um, when looking around, you know, everybody seems to have a, uh, some type of a, a grill these days, you know, and if you have, you know, something like a, a propane grill, um, you know, they do, you know, if, if they're covered, if they're not covered, they do still attract pests. And one area that, you know, cockroaches love to get into, uh, are these grease traps that can either be something like a can hanging below. Other types of grills will have a, a flat pan, you know, underneath the, uh, the burners that collects any kind of drippings that come down and, and uh, um, they'll just collect those into a, a reservoir. And we know, you know, pests like grease, um, you know, it's basically a, a fat source for them, uh, potentially maybe even somewhat of a protein source, but um, they will definitely feed on that. Uh, also, if the grill isn't cleaned, uh, you know, after each time a uh, customer uses it, you could have, you know, again, food debris in there uh, and pests will definitely uh, appreciate that. It's basically a free meal for them. So they will, uh, you know, congregate in those areas. So other things to look at now, you don't treat the grill, um, but you would check those uh, grease traps, you know, and uh, maybe the grill plates themselves and you know, maybe advise that customer, hey, these should be cleaned off a little bit more. Grease traps should be emptied every time. And uh, that's going to help uh, reduce the number of potential pests such as cockroaches and ants that you may have you know, getting around that house. Uh, another thing to look for, uh, you know, tree limbs or, or, you know, foliage touching the structure. And this is important because you know, if you're doing something like a treatment, you know, a, a five foot wide band or maybe even a 10 foot wide band around a house um, and you have a large tree where the branches, you know, can come down and touch the, the, the roof or, you know, the sides of the home. Uh, if you just treat, you know, that uh, surface, you know, five or 10 feet out from the structure um, and let's say that doesn't encompass where that tree is growing. So it's outside of that 10 foot zone. Plenty of ants and other pests can climb that tree, go up and down the branches, gain access to the structure, really, and avoid that treatment that you put down. So, you know, these types of things where the tree branches are touching uh, should be addressed and, uh, you know, should be, you know, cut back from the house. You know, and the other thing, you know, what else do tree branches touching the roof do? Uh, well, if you have any kind of wind, uh, they're going to move back and forth, you know, on those shingles or on that roofing and potentially damage it over time, cause uh, a lot quicker wear and tear on that roof. And uh, again, you know, possibly cause some very, very costly repairs uh, for that customer. So uh, again, just important things to, to note. And, you know, again, most customers would appreciate you, you pointing things out like this to them.
so this kind of brings us to you know homeowner cooperation. And I know every homeowner, you know, we go out there, we we talk to them, we do our inspection, and they do everything we tell them, right? They go out, they clean up stuff. They, uh, if they have debris like this, they're they're more than willing to move it, right? So they'll they'll go ahead and, and clean that up for you. So next time you come out, you won't see it, and uh, uh, you'll do a much better job with the uh, treatment out there. But that's again, not always the case. So. Uh, this is essential to gaining control, though. You know, if you can, you know, communicate these things to them, and this is where, you know, if you do that diagram or you know, take a snapshot, Google Earth photo, and you could note where you found, you know, debris like this on the right hand side here. Um, it, it doesn't leave it up to, you know, question whether you told them or not on the first visit or on the inspection. You have it noted on your your graph and or your notes, and um, it takes that question out whether you told them to do anything with it or not. Um, other thing is, you know, if you know if you have a homeowner that can't remove this kind of stuff for some reason, it may be something that you can do. So we're all, you know, here to make make money, uh, you know, do pest control, um, and removing this type of debris, you know, in my mind, you, you're removing potential harborage, uh, is a, 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 a source of pest control. So possible revenue generator, if they can't do it, maybe you say, look, we'll bring a crew, we can remove some of this debris for you. Um, and this is what it's gonna cost. And maybe they'll do it, maybe they won't. But again, it could be another way to generate some, uh, some revenue these days. And overall, you know, it's gonna be increased uh, customer satisfaction if you can you know, help them deal with some of these issues and um, make their home pest free. Um, so really some of the elements, you know, for perimeter pest control, we're not going to get into a lot of this, but uh, you can apply residuals, you know, as a, as a insecticide band around uh, the perimeter to treat those cracks and crevices and entry points. Uh, any pest trails or nest sites, you know, you definitely want to hit those. Um, modify the habitat. Again, remove those harborage areas, those food areas, those water areas. Uh, seal up those cracks or entry points. And really, you know, the pesticide application is not the service. It's really your knowledge. So, um, you know, we can use pesticides all day long, but if you don't correct those other conditions, um, it, it's really not going to be uh, that successful for, for uh, you or your customer. So a little bit of a switch in gears here, you know, um, so when you are putting out a, a, a pesticide or insecticide, how do you know how much to put out? So you read the label, right? Um, and it tells you to put out, you know, one ounce and a gallon of water um, over a thousand square feet. So how do you know how much you're actually putting out there? So we all can, you know, mix up that, you know, one ounce and a gallon, half ounce and a gallon, you know, let's say it's, you know, 1% solution, whatever, we can mix that up. But really all the data for, I'd say, just about 99% of products that are on the market is generated by looking at amount of product you put out per thousand square feet. Um, you know, I, I, I dare to say sometimes the percentage in your tank doesn't matter. It's really the amount of, uh, of, of product you're putting out per area. Uh, that's where you really learn, or really see uh, the data and, and the efficacy of a product. So we're talking a little bit on calibration. So what does that mean? Uh, a dictionary definition here was to determine correct range for an artillery gun or mortar by observing where it hits. So kind of the same is true for applying an insecticide, but, but a little bit more. Um, you want to see where that material that you're putting out there, where it hits. So where's it all going? Um, you know, how much area are you covering with it? Uh, and by knowing this, you can you know, definitely be more efficient in your pest control. Uh, you won't be wasting by product by putting out too much or too little and then maybe getting callbacks. So you need to know where it goes and how much goes there. So this is just a little hand sprayer. So how can we calibrate, you know, something like this? So easy way to do it, you know, fill up your sprayer uh, with a known quantity of water. And you don't, you don't use the, the actual insecticide, but you just use water here. So this is a one gallon sprayer. So we put one gallon of water in it. Um, I have one with a pressure gauge, so I know what the pressure is on it. So I pump it up to say 20 PSI. 
Um, if no pressure gauge, um, then you just say, all right, we're going to pump it 10 times. And that's going to be what you use to do your, your calibration. Um, so select the tip you're going to use. Uh, this case, we're going to do a coarse fan. Um, so your sprayer is now ready to go. Um, so we have to know how much area you're retreating, right? So I'd say measure off a two foot wide area uh, by 50 feet long. That'll give us about 100 square feet. And two feet wide is about what that fan spray will do. Uh, so with that in mind, we measure off a quick area, something like this. So two foot by 50 feet. Um, we have our known PSI uh, that is pumped up to. Um, use a stopwatch. Uh, and measure the time it takes to spray that area. So you just walk along that 50 foot long uh, treatment zone, walk normally as you normally would, uh, mark down the time it took to start and stop. And then what you do is when you do that 50 feet, you measure how much water was applied. And I would do this about three times. And really all you do is you dump out the remaining water in the sprayer and you started with a gallon. So if you used, you know, uh, maybe you used a quarter gallon, maybe you used, you know, 20 ounces, whatever it is, uh, but you can measure that each time. So here I did it four times, you know, measured how much time it took me to do it, um, measured my volume each time uh, on that 100 square foot, you know, 50 by uh, two foot wide section. And if you just multiply that by 10, that gives you how much you put out per thousand. Now, in this case, we averaged about 125 ounces per thousand. A gallon is 128 ounces. So we know we're doing about a gallon per thousand square feet. I measure the speed just to make sure that I'm not going really fast one time or really slow. It just shows me that I'm doing fairly average uh, walk. So this helps us, uh, you know, be consistent in what we do. Gives us a great idea of what we're putting out there per area. Um, and each technician needs to do this for themselves. So if you calibrate and you say, okay, this sprayer for me is putting out a gallon per thousand may be completely different for another uh, another uh, technician. So um, each one has to really calibrate on their own. Do this once or twice a year, you know, just to make sure you're staying consistent. Uh, very, very simple to do. Um, one thing, you know, pin stream application, uh, this is what you typically do around windows and, and doors, things like that. Um, I had a question a few years ago, well, how much does that put out per thousand? And if you do this same type of calibration, um, do a one inch wide band around the window um, and measure how much you're putting out, believe it or not, you're actually putting out about four gallons per thousand based on, on my quick uh, uh, calibration. So, and most labels only allow for that one inch band around windows and doors. So what that may tell you is that if you're really putting out four gallons per thousand here and your max label rate is one ounce of product per thousand, you're gonna to have to put in one ounce and four gallons uh, for that type of a treatment, okay? So just something to think about, um, you know, and, and uh, there, there is a difference between those tips and, and uh, whether it's pin stream or not on, on how much product you're putting out. Um, most of us use, you know, equipment such as, you know, a spray rig, you know, backpack sprayer, maybe a mist blower or a spreader for granular products and the spreaders, you can calibrate them the same way. Um, sometimes they're a little bit, I don't say harder to calibrate, but you actually may have to use you know, your live granular product because you're probably not gonna have a blank um, carrier with no active on it. So maybe you know around your office building or something like that, an area where it can be used, where that product can be used, do your calibrations you know, uh, in that way. Uh, just mark off a 10 foot wide by you know, 50 foot long and uh, do your calibration there with the spreader the same way. So where do you, where are we gonna treat on these types of uh, um, uh, service calls? You know, base, to, base of the foundation, you know, foliage around the property, the soffits, uh, you know, areas such as these, you know, maybe into some of these shrubs or areas where, you know, pests are gonna hang out and hide. Um, you kind of just think like that best. So where is it going to be? And those are the areas you're gonna to want to target for treatment. Um, granular application, we talked about this a little bit already, but again, you're gonna do so many pounds per thousand, just mark off that area and do it just like we did um, with the liquid application. Um, there are some 
upcoming EPA label changes. And I've been hearing about these for, gosh, about a year now. Uh, you're going to start to see these on, I'd say, just about every insecticide product out there that you can spray on a foundation. So that perimeter band where now you can go out to 10 feet, um, that will be reduced to seven feet out from the structure. Um, and then they will also um, only allow it two foot up on vertical surfaces, not three. I know some states may already have these types of restrictions. I know California, they already have their, uh, some of their restrictions may be a little bit different than this, um, but these are some new things that EPA is, is uh, rolling out. Um, so this stresses the importance of, you know, looking at your labels, um, I would say on an annual basis because labels change quite often. And, you know, keeping track of that is very important because, you know, something like this, if you're used to using, you know, a product that you can do a 10 foot band today with, um, maybe next year it's only seven. On your service tickets, you're writing down, you're doing 10 and you get inspected. Uh, and that new label says you can only go seven, uh, you can avoid some, uh, some possible uh, uh, citations there. So just always check those labels at least once a year uh, and make sure that um, you're up to date on, on the new changes. All right, so I went through that pretty quickly just in the uh, interest of time, uh, since we had a little delay getting, getting started. Um, so now I'm just gonna go run through a few you know, common perimeter pests. I'm going to go fairly quickly through these as well, uh, just to kind of keep everything on time here. Uh, but things you'll see around the perimeter, you know, something like a black widow spider. I think we've all seen these. They're pretty much across all the eastern U.S., uh, really from the northeast down to the south, uh, all the way over through Texas, Kansas. So they're pretty much everywhere. You don't always see them. Uh, I was unaware these are pretty prevalent up in New Jersey. Um, Never saw one, I grew up there, um, but I did find one at my sister's house. Uh, she's still up in, in that area. Uh, so very interesting to see it. I'd never seen one up there before. And this was just in the past you know, five years or so. Um, they're glossy, uh, black in color. Um, they have a red hourglass or orange hourglass shape uh, beneath the uh, abdomen. Um, that could be pretty distinct or pretty non-distinct. But typically, there is some type of that uh, yellow color or uh, red or orange coloration there. Um, they are public health pests. They can inflict the bite that um, can cause some severe reactions in some folks. But uh, for most of us, it, even though it's a black widow, it's probably not going to be that bad. Um, but you could get things like you know, abdominal pain, back pain, redness at the bite site. Uh, very messy web builders. So, you know. Uh, they like to be in corners, garages, wood piles, you know, in some pretty out of the way places. So just spray the web, spray the spider, and you'll, you'll take care of it. Um, the brown widow spider, uh, this one's kind of interesting. I think there's been some new data recently or new reports that this one is sort of, let's say, displacing black widows, but you're seeing more of the brown widow in areas where black widows were. A uh, couple key things, again, um, a little bit different coloration, uh, more brownish in color. They do have an orange marking under the abdomen as well. Um, their egg sacs are fairly diagnostic. They are very spiky. Uh, I came across uh, uh, one of these on a gas pump in Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, so again, they can kind of be almost anywhere. Uh, and I would say just be careful where you put your hands sometimes because again, this was right on a gas pump. Uh, people using it back and forth, you know, um, so pretty prevalent uh, spider as well, um, but more more probably southern states than northern states at this point. Uh, but again, uh, if you see them, you know, spray them, spray the web. Um, you know, could even use a vacuum to remove uh, the spiders and the egg sacs, uh, but make sure that bag is sealed and then disposed of properly. Uh, this one is the uh, wolf spider. Uh, these guys are prevalent all over the place. Uh, they could be anywhere from you know, fairly small, maybe half inch in size, up to three inches in, across from uh, uh, leg tip to leg tip. Big, hairy, brown spiders. Uh, they can well, they can get inside pretty easily. They don't really want to be inside. They want to be outdoors. They're an ambush spider. Um, they're actually a, a beneficial uh, out there in the environment. But folks uh, that see them, 
you know, especially indoors, um, will, will not be happy. Uh, so getting a good treatment around the exterior will help keep them out. Uh, these guys, uh, one thing that they will do, they're all pretty much this brown color, a few brown uh, markings on them as well, or, or darker markings on them. Uh, they do, the females do carry their egg sac with them. So that is a little bit diagnostic. And believe it or not, their, their eyes do reflect light at night. You can go out with a flashlight, look in the mold, look under the foliage, and sometimes see these guys with their eyes uh, reflecting that light back, kind of like what a cat would do, but you know, a lot smaller, obviously. Um, so again, just a good perimeter treatment will help keep them out of a structure. Uh, deer ticks, uh, these guys, you know, these are Lyme disease vectors. So again, uh, public health pest here as well. Key to this one is really the uh, getting control of that nymph and larval stage. Um, they're the stages that most times are transmitting disease and most active throughout the summer months. So really June, July, August. Um, and again, having a good barrier around the structure. Uh, sometimes you, if you're allowed uh, license wise, you're treating the perimeter of the property as well, where there's some vegetation or taller grassy areas, because uh, they're going to crawl up on those grasses or that foliage. And as you walk by, they're going to you know, attach to you or, or your pets. So um, again, this one, uh, again, doing a good perimeter barrier, uh, then hitting those areas of, of a little bit taller uh, vegetation. Um, if there's any trails on the property that people walk on, foliage on either side of the, those trails as well, because that's where these guys are gonna hang out. Um, so uh, dog tick, again, uh, this one, uh, they, they also can transmit some diseases. Uh, pretty much a, a brown tick. They kind of have a, a lighter tan, you know, shield, I guess you can say on them as well, up in this area here. Um, really associated uh, most times with, with dogs, uh, but they are outside, you know, in wooded areas. Um, and again, same thing, more those summer months or, or when they're more active. Uh, these guys can lay thousands of eggs at a time. Uh, we're talking, you know, five to 6,000 eggs. Um, so, very important to you know get a treatment out maybe a little bit early in the season so maybe may june depending on where you are uh, so that any of those hatching uh, eggs you know those nymphs come through that treatment and hopefully uh, get them before they become adults american cockroach again a fairly large cockroach um, they do prefer to be outdoors they will come indoors when there is enough food and, and humidity and moisture uh, but they like those mulched areas leaf litter areas uh, area where there's a lot of you know, organic uh, matter, they will feed on that. Uh, these guys are, you know, can be one to two inches long, also called palmetto bug uh, down in the south. Um, but again, a good perimeter treatment, you know, will give a good residual to keep these guys out. And then also, again, sealing up some of those ways that they can get indoors. So there's pipe openings or penetrations, uh, you know, door flashing. These guys love to get in the garage areas as well. So making sure all that flashing is in good shape. Uh, will help keep them out. Um, brown marmorated stink bug, not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but it's become more of a, a, a pest really in the Northeast. Um, it's similar to something like Asian lady beetle or box elder bugs, where they like to accumulate in the fall on the side of the home. They're getting a good you know, treatment there, where I'll keep them out. Uh, Asian lady beetle, uh, pretty much throughout the US, this was actually introduced as a beneficial to uh, control aphids. Um, these guys are really distinguished by Kind of this M shape up here on the on the uh, on the uh, covering here, and um, again they were introduced. They can have spots. Some don't have any spots at all. Uh, but again, they're pests when they congregate on the siding of homes in the fall. Uh, theory is they think that that's mimicking you know uh, cliff sides where they would overwinter uh, in their native range. So getting a good treatment, you know. Um, you know, around the side of the home or on some of the sides of the home uh, on that siding to help prevent them from getting in or maybe even get them when they uh, make their way out. Pill bugs, uh, these guys again around the foundation, the leaf litter and the mulch, you know, controlling moisture will control these guys uh, as well. So um, if there's a lot of moisture around the foundation, these will be there. And uh, if you get a whole bunch of moisture, a lot of rain, it sometimes forces them out of the ground. They get in through that uh, through the doorways, if there's again faulty flashing there, anywhere they can get inside. Uh, once inside, though, they do 
pretty die pretty quickly because the humidity is not right for them. Um, but you can help knock those populations down by a good residual uh, structure. Um, centipedes, uh, these guys actually were just, um, I believe, put back on the public health list. So these are public health pests uh, now uh, in the US. Um, but they do feed on a lot of other um, you know, arthropod pests that are out there, so insects and spiders. So fairly beneficial until they're running around your house. Um, so again, they're coming in from outside. Okay, you know, sealing up those entry points and getting a good residual, you know, uh, around the foundation uh, will help keep these guys out. Um, there's a bunch of different species, um, you know, the house centipede. Uh, these guys run really fast, um, so they're pretty quick. Uh, again, they can bite and uh, cause uh, uh, sort of like a bee sting reaction. Um, but if someone's allergic, um, it could be more severe. Millipedes. Uh, similar to centipede, except millipedes have two uh, two pairs of legs per body segment versus one. They're also really slow. Um, control the moisture around the foundation. You can control these guys to some degree. Uh, but with millipedes, you've got many generations in the ground around the structure, uh, some deeper in the soil and thatch than others. So they can be an ongoing issue. But again, keeping a good residual, you know, maybe breaking back mulch if there's heavy mulch around the house, treating under that mulch raking it back over and treating as you put it back. We'll get that material a little bit further down where these guys are. Uh, lastly, um, uh, looking at you know pitfalls. So when you're doing any kind of treatment around the property, uh, always walk that property, you know, do that inspection, you know, look for things like fish ponds, bird baths, you know, pet food or pet bowls, um, you know, water bowls, food bowls. Pets in general, people, open windows, open wells, you know, kids' toys, pet toys, tripping hazards, uh, vegetable gardens. Um, most products that you use today, uh, you cannot treat a vegetable garden with it. And, you know, I'll even say herb gardens as well. Uh, they look like weeds a lot of times. So you may not be aware of what they are or where they are. So you have to ask that customer any kind of vegetable gardens or herb gardens. You do not want to treat them because if you do, uh, most times you're going to replace that uh, garden for that customer or those plants at least. Um, and it, it's something that a quick question can answer. Um, you know, if you're treating around the perimeter, you know, looking out for, you know, open windows. Um, you know, I had a, had a customer one time call me and say, you know, the, the pest control guy came around, he was spraying, you know, the shrubs, you know, up onto the soffit areas. And there was a guy on a ladder painting the house around the corner sprayed right over him, didn't even look up and see him. So again, do that quick first walkthrough and that's going to uh, help uh, mitigate some of those issues. Um, one of our newer products for perimeter is Scion. We have a Scion uh, insecticide perimeter assurance program. This gives you 90 day uh, assurance with no retreats. And these are the pests that it covers. So things like ants, cockroaches, crickets, earwigs, spiders. Um, and the rate ranges for those. And again, we'll guarantee a 90 day uh, no retreatment. If you do get a retreatment, we will give you the product to uh, go out and redo that. And I went through that really fast, um, but thank you. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions that anyone has. Um, here's my contact information.